over here, or, or you can put it on the back. You don't need that. Are you needing a bag on the chair? Okay, well, let's put it in the radio mic under there. Well, I think it's time to start. Can you hear me? <laughs> Good. Well, obviously, Stephen Hawking doesn't need an introduction, but one thing that is important is that if you want to take pictures, please remove the flash. As you will see, he can only communicate through his eye, and therefore, if he gets uh, blurred or uh, you know, this vision, he cannot see, and therefore, he cannot communicate. So you are certainly welcome to take as many pictures as you like, but please make sure that the flash is off. Okay? Anyway, uh, we are really very happy that Geneva University is celebrating its 450th anniversary because as vultures, <laughs> we jumped on their backs to be able to have Stephen Hawking here. So Stephen is going to speak uh, today here, slightly more technical talk. Next week, he will give a public talk in Geneva University in Unimai, and I guess that you are all welcome to go. Now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce you to Professor Stephen Hawking. In the beginning nothing existed, only darkness was everywhere. Suddenly, a thin disk emerged from the darkness, one side yellow, and the other white, appearing suspended in midair. Within the disk, sat the creator, the one who lives above. When he looked into the endless darkness, light appeared above. He looked down and it became a sea of light. To the east, he created yellow streaks of dawn. To the west, tints of many colors appeared everywhere. Similar creation myths occur in other cultures. The early attempts to answer the age-old questions, why are we here? Where did we come from? A key question was, did the universe have a beginning? Was there a moment of creation? Or had the universe existed forever? The answer generally given was that humans at least were of comparatively recent origin because it must have been obvious even at early times, that the human race was improving in knowledge and technology. So it can't have been around that long, or it would have progressed even more. For example, according to Bishop Usher, the book of Genesis placed the creation of the world at nine in the morning, on October the 27th, 4004 BC. However, there were others who argued that the universe had had no beginning, but had existed forever. For example, Aristotle, the most famous 
was of the Greek philosophers believed the universe had existed forever. Something eternal is more perfect than something created. He suggested the reason we see progress was that floods or other natural disasters had repeatedly set civilization back to the beginning. The motivation for believing in an eternal universe was the desire to avoid invoking divine intervention to create the universe and set it going. Conversely, those who believed the universe had a beginning used it as an argument for the existence of God as the first cause or prime mover of the universe. This division of opinion has continued to the present day. Many scientists have felt it necessary to believe that the universe has existed forever in order to avoid a moment of creation at which the laws of physics broke down and one would have to invoke a divine creator. For example, while it worked a steady state theory in order to avoid a breakdown of physics at the Big Bang. Although in its original form, the steady state theory was ruled out by observation, it has been revived with a much higher expansion rate by the idea that there is eternal inflation in the early universe. Again, this avoids a beginning, a moment of creation. A similar motivation seems to exist for the pre-Big Bang and ecbarotic universes. <laughs> the aim of this lecture is to show that the universe can have a beginning without any breakdown in the laws of physics. Quantum theory causes universes to be spontaneously created out of nothing. The amplitude for this can be calculated using standard techniques applied in a non-standard way. According to Feynman's idea of a sum over histories, the quantum state of the universe at the present time is given by a path integral over all fields that interpolate between an initial surface and the present surface. This is standard quantum field theory. The non-standard part is that hurdle and I showed there is a non-zero amplitude for the final state, even when there is no initial surface. This is given by a path integral over all fields on a region whose only boundary is the final surface. One might well ask, how can there be a region with a final surface, but no initial surface? This is indeed impossible with a real space-time metric unless it has closed time-like curves and violations of causality. <laughs> However, in order to define path integrals, it is necessary to wick rotate them. One changes the time coordinate, t, to imaginary time, tau equals i t. This changes the Lorentzian metric of Minkowski space to the positive definite metric of Euclidean space. The path integral becomes an integral over a damped exponential rather than a solitary.
that suggests that in quantum gravity, one should take the path integral to be over all positive definite metrics. The so-called Euclidean approach to quantum gravity has been very successful with black holes and is the basis of the ADS-CFT correspondence. The obvious interpretation of the amplitude for a final surface, but no initial surface, is that it is the amplitude for the spontaneous creation of universes out of nothing. Given that this amplitude is non-zero, it is reasonable to suppose that it is the total amplitude, and that there is no contribution from initial surfaces. This is called the no-boundary proposal. It implies that the universe is self-contained and determined by the laws of physics alone. There are no initial conditions set by a supernatural agency. I shall describe the consequences of the no-boundary condition for the universe. This is based on joint work with Jim Hurdle and Thomas Hertog. I shall assume that the universe contains one or more scalar fields, phi i. For simplicity, I shall describe the case of a single scalar field, but the extension to many fields is straightforward. The scalar fields will have a potential, V. I shall assume that V is positive everywhere, and has a small positive minimum value, V0, at phi equals 0. Then for small phi, V will be quadratic, plus a constant. The amplitude for spontaneously created universes, psi, will be a functional of the metric, H, of the final surface, and the scalar field on the surface. Psi is given by a path integral over all metrics and scalar fields, on a region whose only boundary is the final surface. Psi can be estimated by the saddle point approximation. The prefactor, A, is normally ignored and set to 1. For small final surfaces, the solution of the classical field equations will have a positive definite or Euclidean metric, and the action, B, will be real. However, for large final surfaces, the solution and the action will be complex. The complex solutions will be semi-classical, with the imaginary part of the action varying much more rapidly than the real part. They will tend to real space-times at large radius. Thus there is an amplitude for universes to be spontaneously created out of nothing.